Hello, James. Thank you so much for being part of the interview. Yeah, nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you. You know, I'm so excited to have you on our show today because you are a pioneer in terms of bringing technology and creative art together, you and your crew of, of crazy, funny people. And I'm really thrilled that our audience is going to get a chance to know you know, who has been behind some of the amazing open source technology fun out there. And uh, you guys have done amazing work, so I'm super happy to have you here. It's my pleasure. <laughs> Great. Hello, everyone. My name is Susan Lee McDonald, and welcome back to the interview. Today we have world-renowned James Powderly. He is an innovator extraordinaire, and you're going to get to hear all about the fantastic stories that he has to tell about technology, creative art, and his life here in Korea. So let's get a chance to interview James today. James Powderly is a new media artist who combines art with science to open new horizons. With only $50, James Powderly created the iWriter, an eye movement recognition device that sent a message of hope to the world by helping a paralyzed artist reclaim the joys of communication and creation. Powderly, who is currently working on a Korean version of the iWriter, was also behind LED throwies, LED messages that create instant light art, and laser tagging, sending social messages via laser graffiti on urban buildings. His work has pioneered new fronts in urban artistic communication. Powderly was fascinated by music and computers from a young age. And his passions found a perfect combination of science and art when he worked for a project for NASA. Join me, Susan Lee McDonald, and hear his fantastic story on this week's The Interview. You know, you have a very kind of colorful past, uh, from what I understand. <laughs> you have worked it's with colorful. NASA, you have worked with music, you have been imprisoned in China, you have uh, uh, met the love of your life here in Korea. You've got such uh, an eclectic uh, and interesting history. Um, if you had to choose one thing to say, you know, this is me, what would that be? Well, that, that would normally be tough, but um, in two weeks, I'm going to be a daddy. So, uh, yeah, that's the, it's my life's work. <laughs> what can you say about the idea of becoming a father? There must be so many things running through your head because of that. I don't know, I'm, a, I'm an amateur, you know? <laughs> um, but uh, I definitely appreciate that my parents were pretty good mm -hmm. at being parents and they encouraged me to do uh, really everything that I wanted to do and they, uh, my father in particular pushed me to study computers even when I just wanted to be a rock and roll musician or a skateboarder. Mm -hmm. He said just, you know, mix in the Commodore 64 that we bought in there and... Oh my gosh, I had a Commodore 64 You had a Commodore 64? Oh, it's a beautiful <laughs> machine. You know, and with the, and tape the first cassette. Atari too, yes. I had a tape drive. Mm -hmm. This was amazing, you know. Mm -hmm. but, but my dad ended up being right that that computer became like a big part of my life in a way that I, you know, no kid thinks, oh, I can't wait to go home and program a computer in BASIC. But that, that work that I did then helped me to, uh, you know, become the not that great programmer I am today. You are known for being one of the innovators for an incredible project known as the iWriter. Can you tell us a little bit about what is the iWriter and um, why it's become such a phenomenal success? Yeah, well, um, yeah, okay, so uh, the iWriter is this piece of technology that a group of uh, five, six, seven of us made, friends of mine and colleagues that I worked with over the year, as well as strangers that we met, um, that was designed to help just one man mm -hmm. named Tony, mm -hmm. um, a graffiti artist. His graffiti mm -hmm. name is Tim Tuan. Mm -hmm. Sort of superhero name is Tim Tuan. And it was designed just to be able to help Tony draw again because mm -hmm. he'd been an artist his entire life mm -hmm. 
quite talented artist, mm -hmm. and uh, that was taken away from him when he was diagnosed, I think, 2003, mm -hmm. with Lou Gehrig's disease, oh, also wow. known as ALS. Mm -hmm. So he couldn't move his legs, his hands, his feet. Mm. Um, he couldn't even eat or wow. breathe, not talk. So his eyes were the only interface. Mm -hmm. So we were introduced through some friends of his and um, a production firm in Los Angeles called the Ebling Group gave mm -hmm. us a little bit of money. You know, mm -hmm. here's some plane tickets and this is all the money we can afford. Mm -hmm. See what you can do. Mm -hmm. And um, so we made a device that, that allowed Tony to uh, again be able to draw. Mm -hmm. And then over time other people have taken it and improved upon it. Wow. The idea was open source so mm -hmm. you know they, they could do what they wanted mm -hmm. and it just snowballed. Mm -hmm. And so what started with five people ended mm -hmm. up being hundreds and a company the size of Samsung working on making technology right. not just creative technology but essential communication mm -hmm. and navigating maps and mm -hmm. things like this. So you know we, we just made seeds in the ground and mm -hmm. then, um, you know, the internet and, you know, human hearts, you know, did the rest. Yeah. How does the iWriter actually work? Could you explain it in kind of layperson terms? Because mm -mm. um, I'm not super tech savvy. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a pretty simple device, honestly. Um, uh, there's a few variations of it, but the basic idea is that you put a camera, mm -hmm. um, so that it can see your eyeball. Okay. And then you point uh, infrared LEDs, mm -hmm. and when they shine onto the eyeball, mm -hmm. they cause the pupil mm -hmm. to stand out from the background, the mm -hmm. rest of the eye. Mm -hmm. So then you just track that darker spot as it moves around the frame. Mm -hmm. And there's some math that kind of makes it match up with the screen. Mm -hmm. But if you track that eyeball around, you can start to it's like calibrate it mm -hmm. to where that eye is looking on the computer monitor. Wow. And then the rest was just recreating interfaces that mm -hmm. exist now in software mm -hmm. you know, we use all the time, like Photoshop mm -hmm. or Illustrator, but they're not designed for an eye. Mm -hmm. An eye is like a, not, not like a, a mouse pointer, you mm -hmm. know? It needs a bigger button, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. So then the, the programmers who worked on designing the interface, Theo Watson and Chris Sergrew and mm -hmm. Zach Lieberman, they made bigger buttons and mm -hmm. they made new interfaces so that they could you know, roll over and look at a button and that would make another menu pop up. Mm -hmm. and, you know, so they kind of had to invent with Tony a way to draw with your eye. Wow. And then he's been able to make, you know, the graffiti artwork he made before, mm -hmm. but also new things that you know no one had ever thought mm -hmm. to make, like mm -hmm. a font, only the first font, human mm -hmm. font, made with the eye. Wow. So all eye-drawn font, um, and many other really cool projects. That's so wild. My collaborator Evan Roth mm -hmm. translated this into three-dimensional designs, too, mm -hmm. that could be printed out. One of our collaborators named Golan Levin mm -hmm. converted it to machine instructions so that his eyes could control a robot arm. Huh. So with his wow. eye, he could actually physically paint again with this sort of surrogate machine. Um, it's amazing mm -hmm. that all this is possible, yeah. and it's not even that hard, and wow. it's actually not that expensive either. With your iWriter project, um, well, you worked with a number of people to create that iWriter project. You also uh, came to Korea to, to do some work with the iWriter project, is that right? I was living in Korea at the time, mm -hmm. and I was giving a presentation at um, a technology forum, mm -hmm. and a group of, uh, of uh, audience members came up to me after the talk, mm -hmm. and they said, you know, hello, we, we've seen a TED talk about this, this device, the mm -hmm. iWriter, mm -hmm. and at our company, we became interested in it, and in our free time, we started just playing around with it. And at some point, their company noticed mm -hmm. that they actually made uh, a cool project. Mm -hmm. And so they said, you know, you, you don't have to just do this in your spare time. Why don't you do this for your job, mm -hmm. for a few months at least? Mm -hmm. And they said, well, you know, I, I don't know that it can make money. Mm -hmm. And the company said, we don't care, you know, mm -hmm. this is good work. Mm -hmm. So um, 
they took me to their company mm -hmm. and to, to look at it, which turned out to be Samsung. Mm -hmm. And um, they had invented a Korean version of uh -huh. the iRider called the iCan. Mm -hmm. And so there is as much more about human communication in general I see. versus ours, which was much more about artistic endeavor. Mm -hmm. But, you know, being more talented programmers, they had made really smart decisions and improved the hardware design in some mm -hmm. simple ways that made a big difference. Mm -hmm. And so it's nice to see that you know even even a giant company mm -hmm. uh, is willing to take the time sometimes to work on projects that have no financial mm -hmm. uh, bottom line, mm -hmm. but just have a social bottom mm -hmm. line. Mm -hmm. And I think, in collaboration with a group called Design Dive, mm -hmm. they're going to put a thousand eye writers into patients' hands. Wow sometime this year so that's pretty incredible yeah I mean up to that point yeah. maybe 10 people in the world had eye riders huh. and now suddenly huh. an order of magnitude bigger so so James you mentioned that you came to Korea um, in what, 2010 hmm. um, and was it the tech forum that brought you what actually brought you here in Seoul Digital Forum was okay. the first trip yeah oh. Yeah, I stayed in the Walker Hill Hotel mm -hmm. for three days, monsoon season. Oh no. But it was amazing. Yeah, it was <laughs> the fanciest, the fanciest three days of my life. The only time I've ever from business class. Too. Yeah. Yeah, so my initial idea about Korea was just that Korea was like a really wealthy country mm -hmm. where everyone knew your name and there was an amazing buffet every morning. <laughs> so what was it that, uh, that you thought the second time you came to Korea, did you anticipate that you would actually live here? Um, well, I mean, I didn't specifically think, you know, one day I'm going to spend the rest of my life cleaning diapers in this country. Um, but I did, I did love it. Mm -hmm. And I worked with a curator named Shin Bo Su, mm -hmm. and uh, she, she's a curator at the Total Museum, mm -hmm. and she was very, let's just say, uh, she encouraged us to get into trouble. For instance, what do you mean? Uh, we were doing a project at that point called Laser Tag, where mm -hmm. you could draw on buildings with a laser mm -hmm. and um, write whatever you wanted, and we'd mm -hmm. let the public write anything they wanted. And this was during the time of the, the anti-beef protest, okay. and there was protest about Dokto, and mm -hmm. a young woman had gotten killed at the DMZ. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, the streets were like alive with mm -hmm. protest activity mm -hmm. and we were thinking where do we where do we go to project what's mm -hmm. a nice big building mm -hmm. and so she took us right to Kwang mm -hmm. and she said what about this building she says it's called the Chosun Ilbo you know oh. and I was like well, really that's the <laughs> Chosun newspaper yeah. one of the top three newspapers in Korea so we did we set up and we projected on it and people came by and protesters wrote things and normal people wrote things and you know, mm -hmm. the police never stopped us. They came, they saw what we were doing, and they thought, okay, no harm done, and so mm -hmm. they left. Um, but I realize now what a, you know, dangerous, potentially, mm -hmm. you know, uh, controversial scene mm -hmm. that could have been. But so I thought, wow, like, you know, uh, the Korean art scene is kind of edgy. Mm -hmm. And uh, the professionals working here have a lot of integrity, and mm -hmm. they do. Mm -hmm. And so this was one of my initial attractions. Mm -hmm. It's also different from, you know, in Japan, you show up for the show and they've already installed your exhibition. Mm. And you're like, what? You know, mm -hmm. you know, you ask them for whatever you want and they say, yes, you know, hi, <laughs> which is no, you know. <laughs> but in Korea, it's not like this. Mm -hmm. If they don't like it, they're like, no, you know. Mm -hmm. And then also they make you direct. do work. Yeah but they encouraged us to do good work, mm -hmm. you know? So they really pushed us to do something new and try mm -hmm. new things. And it's always been this way that, mm -hmm. you know, we would come with an idea and they would say, how about a, a little more, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. We're like, oh, okay, mm -hmm. you know? So my work was better here and um, I always had fun.
So you were born in Tennessee, oh. and uh, so a good old Southern boy, um, and your passion growing up was kind of a myriad of things, including music, in which you later majored, mm. yes? Yeah, yeah. You know, Tennessee is a, uh, you know, it's the countryside, mm -hmm. you know, it's like a similar vibe to maybe gelato here, you know? Food, mm -hmm. family, mm -hmm. trees, cows, mm -hmm. and, um, I had all these things as a kid and early on I started singing in a choir and that wasn't super cool but mm -hmm. you know I, I learned to love music mm -hmm. and then picked up the guitar at some point. W was your family very musical? Your parents were they in the choir as well? Did they compose music or just I can hear my mom's voice right now in my head being yeah. like, James you better tell him that your mom can sing. <laughs> she sang in the choir her whole life. <laughs> And she could. My mom a, was a good singer. Um, I like your little southern twang. <laughs> yeah. That's my natural voice. I'm faking this. <laughs> really? No. Um, so yeah, my mom, my mom was a singer mm -hmm. and she did encourage me, you know, when I mm -hmm. got invited to be involved in this traveling choir mm -hmm. to sing and to sing in church and things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, music was a, a part of my life. My father had his amazing record collection. Oh, yeah. Original Beatles, all, all the original Beatles album, nice. original Hendrix albums. Wow, nice. Yeah, I, I think I've, I sold these at like, you know, <gasps> used used no. record stores for like five dollars, so I could no. eat a little bit more in college. <laughs> but um, yeah. So uh, my neighbors mm -hmm. played instruments. Mm -hmm. One played the bass, mm -hmm. and one played the drums. And I said, I want to play the bass too. And my friend was like, No, I play the bass. You play the guitar. I was like, okay, I play mm -hmm. the guitar. And then I, you know, I've done that for how many years now? Wow, over 20. I'm old, <laughs> but yeah. And this helped me get into college mm -hmm. and um, became one of those things that, you know, still, you know, while my, my wife sits with her belly like mm -hmm. this and I'm mm -hmm. playing my guitar for my kid and Aww. sing really poorly. She's gonna come out like loving bad singer-songwriter <laughs> uh, tunes. It can it can only get better from there. Yeah. Well, so so with your with your sing. guitar playing, uh, not only to your wife but you know back in the day, uh, did you ever form um, kind of a, an official band with your friends and make you know, cassette tapes too? <laughs> oh God. <laughs> yes. Yes. I made. I will say cassette tape. Yes. Okay. Um, we published the first CD mm -hmm. at any of the, the local band scene in Chattanooga, mm -hmm. Tennessee, in a band called Smack Driven Driver. It's not a drug reference, but okay. um, yeah, somehow. So this band SDD, we played a lot when I was young, and it did give me a taste for performing mm -hmm. and being in front of people, mm -hmm. and you know, the, the feeling of being in front of an audience is mm -hmm. great, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and then Artists oftentimes lose that feeling, mm. you know, because they work for a gallery exhibition or they work for a critique in the newspaper mm -hmm. or something. So I was lucky that my whole art career went in the direction of this performing art. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we would perform our projects like laser tag mm -hmm. or LED throwies in front of these large groups of mm -hmm. people. And it was that same feeling of mm -hmm. everyone kind of getting into the show. And feeling you know. the energy from the mm. crowd, I'm sure, yeah. Yeah, and you know, of course, with the, the Graffiti Research Lab projects, usually the audience was actually doing the performing, mm -hmm. and I was just standing in front of them taking the credit, mm -hmm. which was a great gig. So you get it. tell me about that gap between music school or um, getting your, um, your undergrad, your music major, to the Graffiti Research Lab. There's, there's, there's been some NASA in there. There's yeah, been a weird um, gap. the Honey Bee Technologies. And mm. Yeah, so, um, <clears throat> yeah, I went to the University of Tennessee mm -hmm. and I studied music theory and mm -hmm. composition. And I had a really cool teacher named mm -hmm. Peter Temko, okay. um, who's still a, a teacher somewhere, teaching people how to play the clarinet. And Dr. Temko made us all get email accounts, mm -hmm. you know, back when email was like a, just a tiny window on the computer. You log into yes. Pine and. That was way um, before Google or Yahoo or any of those yeah. companies. Gosh, that's a long time ago. <laughs> what is wrong with me? <laughs> what have I done with my life? 
<laughs> so then we, yeah, we got these accounts, and I loved it. Mm -hmm. I, I, I liked the technology, mm -hmm. and he gave me a chance to run the computer music lab. Mm -hmm. I was a much better uh, fixer of computers than I was a, a performer on mm -hmm. the guitar or mm -hmm. a music theorist. Mm -hmm. So um, I got into graduate school for this type of work, mm -hmm. using computers to make music and mm -hmm. creative things. And that was at NYU? Mm. Mm -hmm. And so I moved from the... You know, I packed my bags and I went to the big city <laughs> and, you know, I loved it there mm -hmm. and I had a good time at NYU and I met a lot of people and ended up staying in New York City for 10 years. Mm -hmm. But after I got out of school, I wasn't a much better artist than I, when I had started, mm -hmm. but I'd become quite good with computers mm -hmm. and programming them mm -hmm. badly, but, you know, fast. <laughs> Tell me about after... NYU mm. and how did you get involved in working with NASA robotics? Mm. Yeah, um, I, at NYU I was uh, a mediocre artist, media artist and designer, but I think I was at least above average with the technology that I learned um, and I enjoyed it a lot. Mm -hmm. And so I, I went in that tech direction and I became really interested in robots. Mm -hmm. So uh, I started uh, a New York chapter of this uh, Robotic Society of America mm. called RSA. And at some point we had to have an event mm -hmm. and I invited a company I'd heard of called Honeybee Robotics. Mm -hmm. And it was just a small mom and pop company that I knew had made a cool robot to fix the inside of the the steam pipes that run underneath New York City. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's lots of steam power mm -hmm. still in New mm -hmm. York, and you know, the, it's very hot, obviously, mm -hmm. inside mm -hmm. of these pipes, so they made robots that mm -hmm. would crawl through and fix them. Wow. And so I'd read about this in the Times or something, mm -hmm. and so I invited them to come speak and discovered they were working on cool projects for mm -hmm. NASA and mm -hmm. lots of other robots to explore planets or to, you know, uh, grab mines and defuse them, mm -hmm. you know, in combat situations. So I thought, oh, it's a very interesting company, mm -hmm. and I want to get a job there as an mm -hmm. intern. Mm -hmm. And so I applied, and they turned me down, and I just kept coming to the door, and I ma made really good friends with the HR person there. And she just, uh, you know, kept saying, I'll try. Mm -hmm. And I kept knocking, mm -hmm. and she really politely, I'll try again, mm -hmm. you know, and I kept knocking, and this went on for so long, mm -hmm. she just became really annoyed. <laughs> and said, please give this guy something. And so someone put me on the task. They mm -hmm. said, Do you, could you program this system mm -hmm. that would help test this robot that we're working on that's mm -hmm. part of the Mars Exploration Rover? Mm -hmm. You would need to program it in this language called MATLAB. Do okay. you know this language? And I said, well, I really know that language well. Mm -hmm. And so... And did you? And of course, yeah. I had never heard of it before <laughs> at all. <laughs> so I went home that night and I just started reading about MATLAB and I mm -hmm. went to the store and bought a book and you know read it over the course of the night and I stayed up all night <laughs> and I came in the next morning and I just worked really hard. Mm -hmm. It turns out it wasn't that difficult to program mm -hmm. it in and you know before the f end of the week I had made something mm -hmm. and I think they appreciated my effort. Mm -hmm. They thought it was adorable. Aww. You know, This idiot trying to become a robot engineer. And so they gave me other little jobs. Mm -hmm. And I stayed there for a few years, and it was a small company, mm -hmm. and they were in the middle of launching their first robot to outer space. Wow. And it was a part of the Mars Exploration Rover. It was the hand, mm -hmm. the grinder on the end of the arm, okay. um, wow. called the rat rock abrasion tool. Mm -hmm. And so after this project, the company just grew and grew. Mm -hmm. And by the time I left, I was the interim director of the technology development group. Wow. So. You know, um, they kind of took me from being an idiot to being a, an idiot with a really big title. <laughs> and I loved it. And I, you know, I only left because, you know, there was other things I wanted mm -hmm. to do and mm -hmm. I wanted to reapproach the arts yeah. again mm -hmm. and see what it would be like mm -hmm. now that I had some actual skill, mm -hmm. what I could make if, if I was given a chance mm -hmm. to just sit around and imagine things. As someone who is uh, very much into technology, as, as you have been for a good part of your career, you know, it's not typical to see a technology-centric person be very artistic, too, and to also combine that work together. And with your graffiti research lab 
um, and the uh, FAT work that you've done, um, you've been able to basically have synergy of both of those things. Um, how does it feel to be able to do two things that you really love to do simultaneously? Mm. Yeah, have my cake and eat it too. <laughs> well, I mean, for a lot of us, it just feels like the way things are. But I mean, I do think it's a little bit of a unacknowledged fact that a lot of really highly technical people are also artistic, musical, specifically musical. Mm -hmm. You know, people like JCR Licklider, you know, who mm -hmm. was one of the, the guy who first said, you know, we should connect these computers together, mm -hmm. you know, in the 60s. Um, his background was in psychology mm -hmm. and psychoacoustics, so how people perceive sounds. Mm -hmm. Really amazing people like Alan Kay, who invented mm -hmm. the graphical user interface. Mm -hmm. Um, and pretty much came up with the idea for the iPad, mm -hmm. but you know he did this in the 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. um, he was like a really talented amateur jazz guitarist, mm -hmm. you know. So you know people do do these creative things, and that creativity is obviously a part of the work mm -hmm. in science because you know science is not just this stepwise process mm -hmm. where you walk towards facts, mm -hmm. knocking down obstacles. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's just a place you have to make a leap mm -hmm. and there's no way to think about it except for creative, mm -hmm. you know? And the same is also true for the arts mm -hmm. or what me and my colleagues did, which in some ways you could call prank art. Mm -hmm. um, and I do, uh, I am proud of being a part of that school of prank artists. Yes. But you know, we, we didn't start out to be prank artists. We were just interested in graffiti. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that there was a lot of humor in graffiti. Mm -hmm. And graffiti artists have a very clever sense of humor. It's mm -hmm. often very mean, mm -hmm. you know? And they're the people in the subway who take the Sharpies and draw little comment bubbles coming out of the mouths of whatever Tom mm -hmm. Cruise in his latest movie and write something dirty or disparaging or, mm -hmm. you know? I, I, uh, I began to admire that mm -hmm. and I began to kind of appreciate the fact that, you know, there was a lot of things I wanted to say mm -hmm. to very powerful people mm -hmm. and, you know, none of us get a chance. Do you find that you are kind of an activist in your nature or you, you go for the mm -hmm. idea of, of just expression of, of your art and creativity or are you both? I know do-gooders, you know, and I'm not a do-gooder, mm. you know, are these do you, really well-meaning people. Do you consider an, people? an activist a do-gooder? Yeah, I think yeah. so. I mean, a lot of them are. Mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of people are just there to be on the scene, mm -hmm. but really well-intended mm -hmm. activists are people who believe strongly in justice, mm -hmm. and I have a sense of justice, mm -hmm. but I mean, my, I do think that my partner Evan Roth and I were much mm -hmm. more motivated by this is fun, or mm -hmm. this is funny, mm -hmm. or I can't believe he just did that, you mm -hmm. know, this sort of instinct. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I went to Europe recently with my wife, and we uh, wanted to go see all the European capitals, Paris, London, mm -hmm. Berlin, nice. um, Florence, Venice, Rome, mm -hmm. and we wanted to go see all the beautiful art in all these cities. Mm -hmm. And while we were there, yeah. We licked the paintings. You licked the paintings? You like actually with, with your tongue? Like We leaned in to inspect their beauty. Oh, and the brush strokes, and then we licked them. <laughs> You're kidding. <laughs> and we licked a lot. You oh know? my gosh. We licked a lot of paintings. My wife licked That's so many. Crazy. My wife licked multiple <laughs> Van Goghs. She said, you know, Koreans really like Manet. That's too And funny. so she licked Manet. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I was more into Cezanne, to be quite frank. Mm -hmm. But I like the moderns. I like Duchamp and Rothko. Wait, wait. I'm just trying to wrap my head around the fact that you're licking artwork. I mm -hmm. mean, did, did anyone see you do this? And, and why would you lick it? Is it just well, for fun? Well, there's different schools of thought okay. about that question. Um, some people lick to collect. You know, they're kind of archivists. Okay. They collect as like an alternative canon. I like this work, and I like this work. 
you know, so I'm going to lick this and this one, you know. And uh, other people I mean, you can take a picture or get a, you know, postcard you could, but you know something. what, honestly, you can't take pictures in most museums these days. You're not allowed to take pictures, you're not allowed to touch, you're not allowed to interact. There's a very strong barrier between mm -hmm. the audience and this artwork that mm -hmm. was oftentimes made by people who were not appreciated by the institution. So that's another reason people do it, mm -hmm. because they as artists feel they have a stronger connection to the art than the curator did. Mm -hmm. And while that may be true, and I think in some cases, myself, I look for the power. Because there really is an exhilarating <laughs> moment when you lick an artwork that, I mean, Andy Warhol, mm -hmm. you know? When I licked, when I licked the Warhol, his self-portrait in the Tate Modern. Okay. Ooh, this exhilarating feeling, and you feel, you know, quite alive, and you walk outside, and, you know, the trees, you can smell the leaves, and, you know, the wind feels fresher and more vivid, and, you know. How, how so. did you get the idea to, to lick? Was it something that, while you were admiring this artwork, you just got too close, and then you just did My it My tongue fun? accidentally slipped up. Like, that sounds like... <laughs> That sounds like a story I've probably heard someone tell their wife before. I just accidentally licked it, honey. No, I, I really, I really, uh, I've been looking for a long, long time. Wow. I mean, I started looking because a, a group of my friends introduced me to the practice mm -hmm. in 2004 or five. Okay. You know, and so nearly a decade of looking. Mm masterpieces from around the world. I mean, I've looked some junk too. I've looked some <laughs> things at people's houses, you know, just something is my sister drew this and I'm, something just draws you to it and you look mm -hmm. it. But, um, you know, uh, I, I used to think, oh, it was just me and my friends, a bunch of graffiti artists acting dumb in a museum. Doesn't and it then, taste bad? I mean, some of it does. It's Rothko got a taste does. kind of... Rembrandt tastes horrible. Wow. It tastes old, you know? <laughs> but. You but it turns out people do it, it all over the world. There's many, many people, and there's artists mm -hmm. that do it. And we discovered in the process mm -hmm. that, in fact, c conservationists who yes. clean paintings yes. clean it with spit. Really? They take spit, and they spit in the cup, and they stick the Q-tip, and they dab it onto the surface. Because oh, it's like the uh, natural digestive mm -hmm. aid, like mm -hmm. some, you know. Exactly. Uh, exactly. And it eats away the dust and dirt, you know. So what we were doing is actually... Uh, helping to conserve the artwork and Love getting it. a great thrill. I just have to say, given the fact that our show is broadcast in 188 countries, I can't take any responsibility if someone goes after Where's us the camera? to I'm find sorry. you. Paris, I'm sorry. <laughs> London, you know. Yeah. My wife said, she said, you don't, we shouldn't feel bad, you know, mm -hmm. because some of these countries have taken Korean artifacts uh -huh. and Korea said, give, give them back. Mm -hmm. And they're like, no, we're going to keep them, you know, because we don't think you can take care of them. I agree with your wife there because uh, France, I believe, has still a mm. lot of very important Korean artifacts. They do. They and do. Uh, I know that they've been in some, you know, negotiations, but in that respect, your wife is uh, very much a patriot because she was willing to kind of risk it in France. Um, she went bonkers at the Louvre, <laughs> I'm telling you. She licked Leonardo da Vinci. At the Orsay, she was like a saliva cannon. <laughs> She's going to kill me. I'm so sorry, EJ. That's too funny. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so Is this translated underneath no, into Korean? No, it's going to be in English. Ah, Changmunim. Sarangyeo. We'll translate that into English. There you go. <laughs> So this is your studio? No, oh, this is this is where all the damage to my career oh, has been done. I love it. Oh my goodness, you know, there's what, what kind of machine is this? This looks well, this very a, serious. This is a drill press. Oh wow. This is very serious. There's no laughing about <laughs> this. Um, also, by the way, oh uh, yeah, this is What is this? This is from a bathroom. Well, actually, this is... Um, he looks like you. This is some of my early modeling work. Oh, no. You know, when I first came to Korea. Wow. Your head is, is a much better shape than his because he's got a really fat head. That's true. Yeah. That's actually very true. That's yeah. a good point. You made a good point. <laughs> so that's when you were extremely uh, back 
head fat heavy. Yeah, you know, <laughs> dieting is so... Yes. So this is where all the magic happens, I imagine. Yeah, 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 there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of things like, you know, light bulbs. Whoa! This is for a project that I did with an architecture firm called Urban Tainer. Okay. We made an inflatable light bulb. Oh, wow. This was kind of fun. And that and, didn't melt at all? Um, no, it was it was lit from the inside by LEDs, oh, so yeah. not using traditional, okay. you know, uh, carbon fluorescence or whatever. And then uh, we became really interested and uh, in did another project with this architecture firm mm -hmm. called Urban Tainer that um, involved co combining you know, it's Korean okay. traditional straw craft. Yes. Mm -hmm. And this is a, called a keron kuromi, mm -hmm. so an egg basket that mm -hmm. they would traditionally sell in like Xijiang in the market. Mm -hmm. They would sell these eggs this way. And so I just thought this was such an interesting and strange design, mm -hmm. you know, but also recyclable and, mm -hmm. you know, no post consumer waste, you know, because okay. it's just straw that dies. And so we started making oh, these sort look of. At that lighting product oh. that would uh, somehow is, elicit this memory. This is like great for Easter. <laughs> great for Easter. Great yes. for Easter eggs. This is true. Easter very popular in Korea. Yes. Um. <laughs> Actually, you can make it more popular next year. How's yeah, that? Yeah, maybe so. <laughs> I'm a man of many masks. Oh my goodness. Is that you? No, yeah, that's me. That's you. Can I see this? Okay, now, you know, I'm not as a uh, tech savvy and uh, creative as you are but maybe if i put this on i will you know get all the the chi you will become bald will become, instantly look at me hello hi how are you yeah. welcome to the interview i'm sorry i forgot to tell um, you that you'll now Susan have a guest from tesla dressed up as james powderly <laughs> I don't want to intimidate you with the science of it or anything because uh, this involves a lot of big words that you, know, <laughs> you probably couldn't pronounce on this show, you know? Possibly not. Um, it's called an LED throwy. <laughs> and you combine a, a battery wow. and an LED <laughs> and a piece of tape. I feel like Einstein yeah. already, uh -huh. just being able to experience this it's pretty good wow it's pretty it's pretty good you know i had no idea that before the show that you were the one who actually helped invent the throwies like i've been uh, i was able to do this like stateside so really you were you yeah. were involved in a throwy thing yeah yeah no this so, was a long time ago wow. it was fun and we were all instantly embarrassed yeah. by it <laughs> but it may be that i actually you know, spend the rest of my life being known as the guy who tried to take credit for putting an LED on a battery. I love this. Can I see? Wow. Yeah. You know, I really love the uh, the ones where people modified it to to have um, that taxidermy oh, version. Oh, the LED rat, mm -hmm. really? Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> so people are crazy, right? Wow. The people that did that, mm -hmm. the woman that did that, is like actually a very talented technologist and one of the co-founders of Instructables, mm -hmm. the website that we initially launched this project on. Mm -hmm. So um, the world is filled with weirdos. Wow. Every corner has at wow. least 50. <laughs> well, thank you, Einstein. <laughs> is that what I think it is, the uh, iWriter? This was uh, one of the original mock-ups oh, for the iWriter. Oh my gosh. Wow. So, that looks a little different than what I saw on uh, I think online. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little sad. Like I say, this is early. Yeah, okay. <laughs> this oh. was small and early. Oh, can you but, test yeah. it out for us? Well, there's not much At testing least. to go here, but, you know, the way this works is mm -hmm. that the, the camera, mm -hmm. which is actually a, a camera from a video game console, okay. is just mounted with, you know, cheap material that you can find huh. almost anywhere. Mm -hmm. And then points at your eye. Wow. And then and tracks the movement of your eye. Yeah. And then spit into a computer that's running software. And this is extremely inexpensive, right? Like you can make this for less than 50 bucks? Yeah, the camera. The camera is the only thing that's expensive. Everything wow. else you can find at any, you know, home, home Depot style mom and pop oh. store in Korea. So if I don't want to use a mouse anymore, then I can just go ahead and try using this. Have fun First, with that. it has to be stylish though. Is this stylish? Does this look good on me? It looks <laughs> it looks more appropriate on you than yeah. me, that's for sure. Hmm. 
<laughs> do I look creative with this? Here. And so basically you have to look into this, or you look at a certain object somewhere out there, and then this just tracks the movement. You just look anywhere. Yeah. So I look there, I look there, I look there. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think I can kind of get the hang of this, mm -hmm. but it has to look, I think, pretty first. No, for me. we'll try. We'll try to do better. <laughs> no, I, seriously, this is a really an incredible invention, and uh, I think that I'd like to be able to see something. Um, is that something that you developed too? This is a brace that I used to wear. Sometimes I wear it to Samsung. You know, <laughs> that's your bracelet. Yeah, it's just a handcuff. It's kanji style. You know. <laughs> I love it. Wow. Starting a gangster and criminal jewelry trend. <laughs> Gangsters show off that they have been, been to jail. I got busted once. It's pretty cool, I think. This is too cool. James, thank you so much for showing me your, your, your lab, your studio. I mean, I think that so many people um, have probably been curious to kind of delve into, you know, where you do your, your stuff. And thank you. Anytime. Anytime. Awesome. So I'll stop by another day and uh, actually test out Thai Rider maybe? No, de, no I'll okay. give you I'll give you the door password. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs>street interviews where they ask Americans where is Kansas and they can't point to it on a map so mm -hmm. I you know I don't know uh, what your average American would know about mm -hmm. Korea mm -hmm. you know I mean certainly the news that that comes in tends to skew towards the you know conflict yeah. or North uh, Korea <laughs> yeah or other let's say bad news mm -hmm. but um, yeah, this, this K-Wave thing is getting pretty crazy. And so now I have friends asking me questions like, what's the deal with the situation between Korea and Japan? Mm -hmm. Why is there tension there? Mm -hmm. People from my hometown. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, this is a little bit more complicated than a Facebook, you know, a Facebook yeah. comment yeah. can really encapsulate. But uh, there's curiosity getting mm -hmm. peaked. Mm -hmm. And so that's good mm -hmm. because you know, especially from my country, mm -hmm. Urinara, mm -hmm. you know, my country, the United States, um, and Korea have a long history together, mm -hmm. you know, a history of, you know, allegiance and mm -hmm. friendship and tension and, you know, uh, it's complicated. Mm -hmm. And so it's one of the countries that Americans should know about mm -hmm. because uh, a lot of my people, my grandfather's age and even my mm -hmm. father's age mm -hmm. have spent time in Korea. And in fact, my father served in the army in Korea and my grandfather served in the Korean War. So you've had three generations of, of men in your family be in Korea. So I guess it seems almost like a natural way for you to, you know, kind of come back here. Did your father or grandfather ever have a chance to come back to Korea after those times? My father did come back to Korea. Really? He came to my wedding. And, um, yeah, he thought it was crazy. Wow. How long had it been since he's been here? He was in, he left Korea in 1970. Wow. So, or what was his reaction? I mean, it's such a different country um, in, in so many ways. I mean, he just went, he just went crazy on the food, <laughs> you know? It was like seeing a, a baby being separated from their pacifier for four decades, you know? <laughs> oh, oh, oh. He tried, uh, you know, all sorts of different types of food, and uh, we went to Jeju-do mm -hmm. as well for my honeymoon. Me, and my wife, my wow. father, and my mother, and my mother-in-law, my father-in-law. That's a that's a very large honeymoon. <laughs> yeah, it was super <laughs> romantic. I can imagine. <laughs> Well, I hear that you also had a very traditional Korean wedding. Is that right? I did have a Korean wedding. Wow. I was married in in um, in. Uh, 
humble. Mm -hmm. and, I bet um, you looked real handsome. I looked very funny. <laughs> Very funny. Traditional wedding service mm -hmm. in the middle of the hottest days of summer this year. Oh my goodness. It was intense. Wow. So a super traditional Korean wedding and a really fun romantic wedding, mm -hmm. <laughs> or, uh, I bet. Um, and I'm sure we have some photos to, to share with everyone about that yeah, too. Yeah, you can have them all. <laughs> we're going to go back to the house and we're going to go through the slide presentation. All 4,649 <laughs> photos. Which, by the way, you know, um, my wife is a fan of horror movies. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, she only likes horror movies. Only? Yeah. I mean, now that she's pregnant, she's mm -hmm. watching, we're watching some romantic comedies, you mm -hmm. know, because she's hormonally a little sensitive. Mm -hmm. But normally, she just hates that stuff. Wow. And she only likes horror, blood, violence, zombies, gore, you know, this type of thing. And so our, our wedding photos, mm -hmm. you know, that's sort of the traditional, mm -hmm. like, like Kyoron Shik Sachin, you know, mm -hmm. these Korean wedding photos where it's like you're sort of kissing, you know, and mm -hmm. they take the photos. Ours were in zombie makeup. So I, I, wore, I wore a zombie costume, you know, and <laughs> she was like a Juan, like the, the sort of grudge style ghost. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's great. People see these photos and they just can't believe this is wow. a Korean, Korean lady. That is too funny. What kind of woman does that? <laughs> like, it's totally her idea. And now she says it's my idea. Mm -hmm. This is how marriage works. <laughs> so, so compromising on who decided to start the uh, zombie makeup. But or you could call it total lack of compromise yeah. and lies. <laughs> How would I like to be remembered? What is this, a uh, Lifetime Achievement Show? <laughs> this is horrible. On you. <laughs> oh my God, how would I like to be remembered? I'm 36 years old, you know? <laughs> like, I don't want to be remembered anytime soon. I mean, I want the, the lady at the bank to remember my face so I don't have to show her my alien registration card every time. But I'm not ready to be remembered yet, you know? Um, I would love to be remembered actually as world's greatest dad, like technically, the best dad who ever lived, you know, if that exists. James, you've done so much in your career uh, and I'm curious what the future holds for you work-wise. Mm. Yeah. I mean, honestly, my, my plan is to continue to work at Samsung. Um, I'd like to work there for a long time. You know, I've gotten to do a lot of things, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm not like a really old guy. Mm -hmm. I'm solidly an Ajashi, <laughs> you know, I'm an adult now. Mm -hmm. um, but I haven't got to spend 10 years, 15 years, you know, working on something. Mm -hmm. You know, I've moved around a lot. and. Now that I have a kid, you know, I'd like to have that type of stability mm -hmm. and I'd like to finally become like a master at something mm -hmm. instead of just doing a bunch of things kind of mm -hmm. eh, mediocre. I'd like to do something long enough to actually get good at it. And so I think I'm going to stay around, hang around the, the IT mm -hmm. technology mm -hmm. development mm -hmm. business. and. Um, I'm really excited about having a kid. Yeah. You know, I keep thinking about all these different strategies for, you know, trying to convince my daughter that she should, you know, program computers and, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, um, uh, keep her from going to hogwans <laughs> and, you know, yes. get dirty and go outside and swim in the Han River. Is that safe? Is that a no? <laughs> Whatever. You know, I'm probably not going to kill her. So, um, you can always try it and see what happens, you yeah. know, you can go in after her. What's the worst that could happen? <laughs> um, you know, so I want to, I want to really enjoy being a dad mm -hmm. and I used to do a lot of things at once and focus on mm -hmm. being a teacher and mm -hmm. trying to run a company and sometimes being an artist mm -hmm. too. And this time I just want to do one job, mm -hmm. you know, for many years. Mm -hmm. 
and then come home and goof off with my wife, mm -hmm. you know, and have fun with my kids and cause trouble and learn Korean really well. It just seems like the perfect type of life that yeah. you described. It feels good. <laughs> A very happy life. <laughs> yeah, it seems, it seems really quite possible. I'm really honestly excited to hear um, about what you're going to do in the future because I think that even if you're working at Samsung, you're going to find a way to do something really innovative and, and creative. And um, someone who is a multitasker as, as you are, I can't imagine that um, you're going to just kind of you know, be a you know, man, as a lot of Koreans say. So mm -hmm. um, I'm looking forward to seeing some cool stuff come out of you and make sure that I'm in the loop there. Next time you do some prank art, I'd love yeah. to join you. Of course, of course. <laughs> and you should wait to see what my daughter's going to be like. It's going to be crazy. I can't wait. Awesome. Well, James, thank you so much for being part of the oh, interview. Comes on, it's done. been absolutely charming. Hey, it's been <laughs> my pleasure. Awesome. Let's Great. all go bowling sometime. <laughs> Can we do laser bowling? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah? Mm. Nice. <laughs>